Hi friends, it's Miss Crystal back here. Um, I'm going to read chapter two of The Hunger Games, so get out your copy and follow along, okay? Okay. One time when I was in a blind in a tree waiting motionless for game to wander by, I dozed off and fell ten feet to the ground, landing on my back. It was as if the impact had knocked every wisp of air from my lungs, and I lay there struggling to inhale, to exhale, to do anything. That's how I feel now, trying to remember how to breathe, unable to speak, totally stunned at the name, as the name bounces around inside of my skull. Someone is gripping my arm, a boy from the seam, and I think maybe I started to fall, and he caught me. There must have been some mistake. This can't be happening. Prim was one slip of paper in thousands. Her chances of being chosen so remote that I'd not even bothered to worry about her. Hadn't I done everything? Taken the tesserae, refused to let her do the same? One slip, one slip in thousands. The odds had been entirely in her favor, but it hadn't mattered. Somewhere far away, I can hear the crowd murmuring unhappily as they always do when a 12-year-old gets chosen because no one thinks it's fair. And then I see her, the blood drained from her face, hands clenched and fists at her sides, walking with stiff small steps up toward the stage, passing me. And I see the back of her blouse has become untucked and hangs out over her skirt. It's this detail, the untucked blouse forming a ducktail, that brings me back to myself. Prim! The strangled cry comes out of my throat and my muscles begin to move again. Prim! I don't need to shove through the crowd. The other kids make way immediately, allowing me a straight path to the stage. I reach her just as about she's about to mount the steps. With one sweep of my arm, I push her behind me. I volunteer, I gasp. I volunteer's tribute. There's some confusion on the stage. District 12 hasn't had a volunteer in decades, and the protocol has become rusty. The rule is that once there's a tribute's name has been pulled from the ball, an elig another eligible boy, if a boy's name has been read, or a girl, if a girl's name has been read, can step forward to take his or her place. In some districts in which winning the reaping is such a great honor, people are eager to risk their lives. The volunteering is complicated. But in District 12, where the word tribute is pretty much synonymous with the word corpse, volunteers are all but extinct. Lovely, says Evie Trinket. I believe there's a small matter of introducing the reaping winner and then asking for volunteers. And if one does come forth, then we, um, she trails off unsure of herself. What does it matter, says the mayor. He's looking at me with a pained expression on his face. He doesn't know me really, but there's a faint recognition there. I am the girl who brings the strawberries. The girl his daughter might have spoken of on occasion. The girl who five years ago stood huddled with her mother and sister as he presented her the oldest child with a medal of valor. A medal for her father vaporized in the mines. Does he remember that? What does it matter, he repeats gruffly. Let her come forward. Prim is screaming hysterically behind me. She's wrapped her skinny arms around me like a vice. No, Katniss, no, you can't go. Prim, let go, I say harshly, because this is upsetting me and I don't want to cry. When they televise the replay of the reapings tonight, everyone will make note of my tears, and I'll be marked as an easy target, a weakling. I will give no one that satisfaction. Let go. I can feel someone pulling her from my back. I turn and see Gail has lifted Prim off the ground and she's thrashing in his arms. Up you go, Catnip, he says in a voice he's fighting to keep steady. And then he carries Prim off toward my mother. I steal myself and climb the steps. Well, bravo, gushes Evie Trinket. That's the spirit of the games. She's pleased to finally have a district with a little action going on in it. What's your name? I swallowed hard. Katniss Everdeen, I say. I bet my buttons that was your sister. Don't want her to steal all the glory, do we? Come on, everybody. Let's give a big round of applause to our newest tribute. Trails Ify Trinket. To the everlasting credit of the people of District 12, no one, not one person claps. No, not even the ones holding betting slips, the ones who are usually beyond caring, possibly because they know me from the hob or knew my father and have encountered Prim, who no one can help but loving. So instead of acknowledging applause, I stand there unmoving while they take part in the boldest form of dissent they can manage. Silence. Which says we do not agree. We do not condone. All of this is wrong. Then something unexpected happens, at least. I don't expect it because I don't think of a District 12 as a place that cares about me. But a shift has occurred since I stepped up to take Prem's place, and now it seems I have become someone precious. At first, one, 
then another, then almost every member of the crowd touches the three middle fingers of their left hand to their lips and holds it out to me. It is an old and rarely used gesture of our district, occasionally seen at funerals. It means thanks. It means admiration. It means goodbye to someone you love. Now I am truly in danger of crying, but fortunately, Heimich chooses this time to come staggering across the stage to, co to congratulate me. Look at her. Look at this one, he hollers, throwing an arm around my shoulders. He's surprisingly strong for such a wreck. I like her. His breath reeks of liquor, and it's been a long time since he's bathed. Bathed. Lots of... He can't think of the word for a while. Spunk, he says triumphantly. More than you, he releases me and starts for the front of the stage. More than you, he shouts, pointing directly into a camera. He is, is he addressing the audience, or is he so drunk he might actually be taunting the Capitol? I'll never know, because he's just as he's opening his mouth to continue. Heimich plummets off the stage and knocks himself unconscious. His disgust, he's disgusting, but I'm grateful. With every camera gleefully trained on him, I have just enough time to release the small choked sound in my throat and compose myself. I put my hands behind my back and stare into the distance. I can see the hills I climbed this morning with Gale. For a moment, I yearn for something, the idea of us leaving the district, making our way in the woods. But I know I was right about not running off, because who else would have volunteered for Prim? Heimich is whisked away on a stretcher, and Evie Trinket is trying to get the ball rolling again. What an exciting day, she warbles as she attempts to straighten her wig, which has listed slightly severely to the right. But more excitement to come. It's time to choose our boy tribute. Clearly hoping to contain her tenuous hair situation, she plants one hand on her head as she crosses to the ball that contains the boy's names and grabs the first slip she encounters. She zips back to the podium and I don't even have time to wish for Gail's safety when she's reading the name Peter Malark. Peter Malark? Oh no, I think. Not him. Because I recognize this name, although I have never spoken directly to its owner, Peter Malark. No, the odds are not in my favor today. I watch him as he makes his way toward the stage. Medium height, stocky build, ashy blonde hair that falls in waves over his forehead. The shock of the moment is registering in his face. You can see his struggle to remain emotionalist. But his blue eyes show the alarm I've seen so often in Prey. Yet he climbs steadily onto the stage and takes his place. Evie Trinket asks for volunteers, but no one steps forward. He has two older brothers, I know. I've seen them in the bakery, but one is probably too old now to volunteer, and the other won't. This is standard. Family devotion only goes so far for most people on Reaping Day. What I did was a radical thing. The mayor begins to read the long, dull treaty of trees, and as he does every year at this point, it's required. But I'm not listening to a word. Why him, I think? Then I try to convince myself it doesn't matter. Peter Malark and I are not friends, not even neighbors. We don't speak. Our only real interaction happened years ago. He's probably forgotten it, but I haven't, and I know I never will. It was during the worst time in my life. My father had been killed in the mine accident three months earlier in the bitterest January anyone could imagine. The numbness of his loss had passed, and the pain would hit me out of nowhere, doubling me over, racking my body with sobs. Where are you? I would cry out in my mind. Where have you gone? Of course, there was never any answer. The district had given us a small amount of money as compensation for his death, enough to cover one month of grieving, at which time my mother would be expected to get a job. Only she didn't. She didn't do anything but sit propped up in a chair or more often huddled under the blankets on her bed, eyes fixed on some point in the distance. Once in a while, she'd stir, get up as if moved by some urgent purpose, only then to collapse back into the stillness. No amount of pleading for Prem seemed to affect her. I was terrified. I suppose now that my mother was locked in some dark world of sadness, but at the time, all I knew was that I had not only lost a father, but a mother as well. At 11 years old, with Prim just seven, I took over as head of the family. There was no choice. I bought our food at the market and cooked it as best as I could and tried to keep Prim and myself looking presentable. Because if it had become known to my mother... If it had become known that my mother could no longer care for us, the district would have taken us away from her and placed us in the community home. I'd grown up seeing those kids 
those home kids at school. The sadness and the marks of angry hands on their faces. The hopelessness that curled their shoulders forward. I could never let that happen to Prim. Sweet tiny Prim who cried when I cried before she even knew the reason. Who brushed and played at my mother's hair before we left for school. Who still polished my father's shaving mirror each night because he hated the layer of coal dust that settled on everything in the seam. The community home would crush her like a bug. So I kept our predicament a secret. But the money ran out and we were slowly starving to death. There was no other way to put it. I kept telling myself if I could only hold out until May, just May 8th, I would turn 12 and would be able to sign up for the Tesserai and get us that precious grain and oil to feed us. Only there were still several weeks to go. We could well be dead by then. Starvation's not uncommon fate in District 12. Who hasn't seen the victims? Older people who can't work, children from a family with too many to feed, those injured in the mines, straggling through the streets, and one day you come upon them sitting motionless against a wall or laying in the meadow. You hear the wails from a house and the peacekeepers are called in to retrieve the body. Starvation is never the cause of death officially. It's always the flu or exposure or pneumonia. But that fools no one. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and then I will come back with the second part of this video, okay? Because I can only record for so long before it cuts off. Okay, see y'all.